once again, and uh, on behalf of the participants, uh, the organizers, delegates, and Prabhu, and the team, we thank you so much, Maharaj. Very happy to see you, Maharaj. Oh, thank you. Thank you very can much, Kripa Prabhu. Can start now, Maharaj. Can I, can start now. I can start now? Okay. Yes, please, Maharaj. Okay, welcome everyone to the second unit, Bhakti Shastri. We're going to do Ishopanishad. Uh, I did forward some material to you. Did you get it? Did you get the documents? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Okay, everyone has it? You've all read it? You've gone through it? Huh? Did you read it yet? Okay, Maharaj. We received late. Today only we received. Well, I would. I I want you to try to keep up with the course. You know, as we go along, because there's going to be a lot of things. I want you to be very careful to try to keep up with everything. So otherwise it will make it very difficult if you fall behind. I know it's not a very big book and there's not a, a lot of things in the, in the book, but what is there is very meaningful. Okay, so we're going to begin on this Ishopanishad. We have, uh, usually when we meet, I will have only 10 classes, but this time because we're only having one and a half hours every evening, so there will, have, there will be 20 classes maybe, or we'll see how it goes. Maybe we'll do less. Uh, okay, I'm going to put on my PowerPoint and introduce you to some of the material, some of the points on this. We're covering this evening, we're going to begin with the, the introduction to the book. Does everyone have a copy of the book, by the way? You have a text, either soft or hard? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so all of you, 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 may, you may have already read through the intro, that introductory essay. You. Introductory as Introduction to the Vedas, a lecture given by Srila Prabhupada, 1973, in London, at the Conway Hall, quite a big prestigious hall. The devotees arranged a series of lectures for Srila Prabhupada, and some of the titles of the lectures were given by Guru Das, and some were given by Srila Prabhupada. Anyway, uh, when they published the Ishopanishad, of, of, you see, Srila Prabhupada had already written the essays on the Ishopanishad previously in India, before he'd even gone to America. He'd already written his uh, commentaries on each of the mantras. You all know how many mantras are in the Ishopanishad? How many mantras? Who knows? Ram Gopinath Prabhu, are you there? Yes, Maharaj. How many mantras in the Ishopanishad? 18, Maharaj. Yes, right. The same as in the Bhagavad Gita, right? 18 chapters in the Bhagavad Gita, 18 mantras in the Ishopanishad. There's one other mantra there, the invocation. Actually, that invocation mantra is not officially a part of the Ishopanishad, but it was put there, Prabhupada put there. I think maybe other commentators also put there when they commented on Ishopanishad. So Prabhupada also did it. And then when, when Prabhupada got to America and he wanted to publish the book, so Prabhupada, he had that lecture from Conway Hall also put in there as the introduction to the book to show the relevance of this book to the Vedic knowledge. You know, we often speak about the Vedas, right? We're presenting the Vedas. We always say we're followers of the Vedas, we're presenting the Vedic knowledge. 
we're going to look at what is actually is the Vedas. So uh, let's go to the PowerPoint. We'll just. Okay, can everyone see? Is everyone? Everyone can see the part. No problem. We all can see Maharaj, very clear. Okay, very good. Let's see. In Shopanishad course, right? Okay, so that's the traditional cover we like to put on the Ishopanishad. So, the first lesson will be the introduction. Doesn't mean we'll cover everything, but you know, that's the first part. We'll begin with the introduction, and then next lesson will be on the invocation, that Om Purna Mantra. I think you have only two memorization mantras for your Bhakti Shastri. I think the, the invocation and the first mantra. Okay, so you can see something of the breakdown of the, the mantras. We'll, we'll be going through the mantras one by one. We'll introduce you to the meaning. So lesson one, introduction. Prabhupada is speaking about the Vedas and he begins talking about proof. Because everyone wants to know, is is, is there God? Not everybody believes in God. What's the proof? What's the proof that what you say is right? You're using scriptures, you, you have your books. It's one kind of proof. So Prabhupada talks about there's different kinds of evidence, right? The word pramana, evidence. So there are three different kinds of evidence. The first one is with the senses. We use our senses to perceive everything. From your, of course, you're, you have not studied the Bhagavad Gita fully yet, have you? You've only done nectar of devotion, but all of you are familiar with Bhagavad Gita. So you know in the Bhagavad Gita there are knowledge acquiring senses, there's also working senses. The working senses, they don't give us any, any of this direct sense perception. We get the direct sense perception from the knowledge acquiring senses, right? So who knows, uh, who, who can be asked, is Nara Narayan there? Nara Narayan? Uh, yes, Maharaj, um, I'm here. Okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Oh, so you can tell us what are the direct sen what are the senses, the five senses which give us knowledge? Uh, the the eyes, the the, the eyes, the ears, the ears. No. Uh, smell and touch. The nose, the skin, yeah. One more. The one we enjoy the most. Uh, the tongue? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. The tongue. Okay, so these are the five senses. We get knowledge from them, right? We get knowledge from the eyes. We say, well, people even say, we have a saying, we say, seeing is believing, right? Have you heard that before? You see something, oh that's, it must be, I saw it, I believe, if you can see it, believe it. So people say, if I can see God, I believe in Him. They want to see. 
evidence is one kind of evidence, but are, 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 are our eyes perfect? Some people, in some philosophies, they say, God is so big, you can't get far away enough to see him, because he's so big. And other times they may say, God is so small, you can't see him. So our eyes are very limited. We cannot see in the dark. I don't know about you, I need eyeglasses to see, to read often. If, there's, if the light is no good, I have to get my glasses, put glasses on and read. Our eyes are very limited, what we can see. So we don't really get such good knowledge from the eyes. The cat, cat can see in the dark. We cannot see in the dark. So our eyes are not perfect. And then the sense of smell, sense of smell, it's a, a very relative thing. Not, some people have a very powerful sense of smell, like animals, insects. They have a strong sense of smell. Human beings, not so, it's not so strong, not so powerful. Many animals have much stronger sense of smell. And then the sense of hearing. Our hearing, especially as we get old, the hearing often goes, you have to get a hearing aid. But some animals, they can hear very carefully, they're very, very quick. They can hear very small, faint sounds. We see the animals often much better, their senses are much more powerful than the humans. Our senses are very limited. So, we don't get such good knowledge. Our eyes, our nose, our hearing, and then the tongue. The tongue is also, some, sometimes you taste something, it tastes, uh, it tastes very sweet. But because you had something bitter, then you take something out, what appears sweet. When you take something bitter, then you take something sweet, then it doesn't taste so sweet. And so the, the different tastes, the, our tongue is influenced by the earlier taste, it influences how we perceive a taste. And skin also. So that's sense perception, not perfect. The second type of evidence, anuman. Hypothesis. Can anybody give me an, a, an, a, a hypothesis? Would you like to give me an example? What is an, a hypothesis? Maybe you could state some kind of hypothesis yourself. It may not be real. Would you like to... Anybody could offer a hypothesis? Uh, a scientific theory, Maharaj? Yeah, can, well, can you give me something? What is their hy what hypothesis do the scientists state? Can you give that me a... That we came from monkeys? Huh? That we came from monkeys? Well, okay, they may say like that. Yeah, that it's a, like a theory, the evolution theory, that we've evolved from the animal, from lower species of life. Okay, that's a theory. You know, speculative theory, right, a hypothesis. Any other kind of hypotheses which are current today? Prabhupada preached a lot about life. Where does it come from? What do the scientists say? Darwin's theory, Maharaj? What, what's the scientific explanation of life? Where does it come from? Oh, you say from the monkeys, it evolved. Where did the, mon where did the monkeys come from? Hmm? Someone? 
Okay, Prabhu, thank you. Big Bang Theory, that's a good hypothesis. Sometimes, sometimes they also say uh, from the black hole or from the white hole or sometimes they simply say life comes from chemicals. So many different speculative theories are there, right? But, but where's the proof? Where's the evidence? It's one kind of, another kind of theory. But another kind of evidence is shabda, or, which means sound, and it means to hear from the authority. So, Srila Prabhupada, in introducing the Vedic knowledge, he brought out this point, first of all, that you get real knowledge by hearing from an authority. Who can give an example? What example would you give to establish the importance of hearing? Sachinandan, are you there? You can tell me. What about your mother? Yes. Prabhupada gives the example, you want to find out who is your father, right? How do we find out who is our father? We ask our mom. Yeah, you should do. <laughs> should ask your mom, yeah. She would know, right. If you go to every man and inquire, are you my father, are you my father, are you my father, will take a long time, right? So many men, you have to go around everyone to try to find out who is your father. That's a, a very long, arduous way. But if you go to the mother, mother can immediately say who is the father. So this is the example Prabhupada would often give to show the importance of hearing. It also indicates the advantage of taking knowledge in the descending manner, coming down, not trying to climb up. You, there's two ways, right? There's ascending or descending. So ascending knowledge is to go around every man to try to find out who is their father will take a long time. But the descending process, you go to the authority, they can immediately tell you. So this is the idea, this is how we establish that uh, shabda or sound, hearing, is very important. Hearing from the authority. Okay, here's a nice example to show uh, the problem with the senses trying to use our senses to understand the object. This is the story of the blind man and they're massaging the elephant. The blind man have been placed at the elephant, right? One man is holding the leg. What is he thinking the leg is like? Like a tree. Yes, he's thinking it's like a tree. Another man's holding the tail. And he thinks the tail is what? A rope. Okay, like a rope, yeah. And someone, and it, it, just on the side there, he's got both his arms rubbing on the side there, the elephant. He's thinking this is what? What's it like? Can you see the bricks in the picture? All the bricks put together. He's thinking it's like a... someone? Huh? 
Bricks. Yeah, the, not just bricks, but they're put together to make a... Brick wall. Yes, a brick wall. Thank you. Brick wall, yeah. Right, making a wall. It's a wall. <laughs> and then someone else is sitting on top of the elephant. He's got the ears of the elephant. So what does he think the ears are? The weapons, like the X. <laughs> yeah. Or we could think even the ears are like some, some kind of fan, you know, like a peacock fan or something. And then the man has got the tusk. He's got the, holding the two tusks. He's thinking they're like... Like the arrow, all right? And here the other man is on the ground, he's holding the trunk. He's thinking the trunk is like... Yeah, like a snake. Or you could see, sometimes we, we would say, like a, a water hose, a hose or something. So are they, are they wrong? Are they all wrong in their description of the elephant? Yeah, they're right. Yes, they're each right. But what's the problem? They don't see the whole picture. Right. They don't see the whole picture. They're only describing one part of the elephant. Right? They're only describing one part. They're not wrong, but it's not complete. You have to put the whole thing together to get the overall picture. The same way, when we want to understand the Supreme Absolute Truth, the Personality of Godhead, we want to understand the whole picture. Not just only a part of Him, but the whole picture. It's an important point to be understood. Okay, so the blind men, they understand a part. The same way we want to understand this knowledge of the Absolute Truth, it's coming in the disciplic succession from Bhagavad Gita, evam param para praptam imam rajar shilvitu. From Lord Krishna, to Brahma, to Narada, to Vyas, to the present day, Srila Prabhupada, the founder Acharya, is passing on the knowledge through the line of authority, through the disciplic succession. So it's important for us to hear, to understand everything in the proper manner, through the disciplic succession. Okay, so, using knowledge, we have, the problem is, we get some knowledge, we just use our own mind and senses to get knowledge, we have a problem, because we are conditioned soul. We're not liberated souls, we are conditioned souls. Two levels of souls, right? There are the liberated souls who are all perfect. Now the liberated souls, they don't have any defects. However, we're not liberated souls. I don't know, are you? Any of you liberated there tonight? No, Maharaj. Okay that we're not liberated, that means we have defects, and there are four defects of the conditioned souls. This kind of knowledge, very basic, should be committed to memory. First one is, 
commit mistakes. We have a saying, to err is human. We say it's human nature to make a mistake. Nobody's perfect, right? We say like that. Of course, there are people who are perfect. They're called liberated souls. We're not. We make mistakes. Have you ever made a mistake? Ram Gopinath, did you ever make a mistake? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we all make mistakes, right? What, 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 what mistakes do we make? Oh, sometimes we, we, maybe we turn the wrong way, we, we, we go on the road, that we drive the wrong way, we, we break some traffic law or something, make some mistake. Sometimes you say the wrong thing, sometimes you do the wrong thing, put your money somewhere, you lose all your money. We make mistakes. You trust someone, you give him recommendation or you may even give him money, and they never give it back to you. You make these kind of mistakes. It's, it's nature. Sometimes we're just doing some calculation and we get it wrong and make a mistake. Sometimes we spell something wrong. Typing, they make a lot of mistakes, typing. At least I do, I don't know about you. Okay, secondly, second defect, illusion. We are conditioned souls, so we're subject to illusion. That illusion may be thinking, first of all, what's the big illusion everyone's in? Yes, the body. Yes, we think we're the body. That's the illusion. Any other illusions, Maharaji? Yeah? Anybody else? Some other illusion? Imperfect senses. No, but I want illusion. I'm talking about illusion. What's your illusion? I think we are the doer. Oh. Illusion, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, nice. We we think I'm the doer. I did it. I did it. Hmm. We have a lot of illusions about life. We're thinking, I will live forever, nobody thinks I'm going to die. We're thinking, I'm young, <laughs> but quick, quickly we become old. We think, I'm very clever, intelligent, but we may not be. It's often an illusion. Number three, cheating propensity. Yeah. Somebody has to turn their mic off. Okay, number three, cheating propensity. Defects of the conditioned soul. Like, we may be cheated. Have you ever been cheated? Yes. Really? Yes, yes Maharaj, when you're young. Yeah, often. When we, often the, the young ladies get cheated. The young man tells her, I love you, I love you. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But then he won't marry her. So this cheating goes on in the material world. A lot of cheating. Business, there's a lot of cheating. We have to check everything very carefully. 
you buy a new car, you think it's a new car, you find out it's not a new car, it's an old car, you may be cheeky. And sometimes, sometimes we're cheated, sometimes we cheat ourselves. We cheat others, sometimes we cheat ourselves. That's, that's another kind of illusion, we cheat. So that cheating nature is there in the material world, due to our conditioned nature. And then finally the imperfect senses, which we spoke about. The eyes, imperfect. We look up at the sun, doesn't look very big, but of course it's a whole planet. We look at something in the water, it doesn't look very deep, but it's much deeper than we think, due to the eyes, the effect of the eyes, imperfect senses. We'll give some examples to show you imperfect senses. Let's see. Uh, oh, here's the Sanskrit word for these different propensities, defects, which are there. This is all stated in the Chaitanya Charita Amrita, taken from Adi Lila, chapter 2. Okay, so commit mistakes is Brahma. Brahma. Brahma means making mistakes, errors, illusion, pramada, can be also madness, cheating propensity, vipralipsa, and imperfect senses, karana apataha, apataha. So these four defects are there in the conditioned soul. Here's a famous picture, maybe many of you may have seen this before. Is this a young woman or is this the old woman? Now someone looks at this picture and they see, you know, the old woman with the bigger nose and the big chin on the bottom there. And someone else looks at the picture and they see the young woman and she's got this kind of braid round her th throat and you can see, you can just see the corner of her eye there. So it's an interesting example of how our senses can trick us. Someone sees an old woman, they're right. Someone else sees a young woman, they're also right. It's how we look at the picture. In, in that picture, both the young and the old woman are there. We have to understand. Another example, optical illusion. The square which is put through the circles, yes, question? The square which is put through the circles, it looks like they're bent. The lines look like they're bent, but actually they're not. They're straight. It's straight lines, but they don't look straight due to the, the circles which they're penetrating. So this is optical illusion. Our eyes have that problem. We don't always see things. Another example, you can see the line. These lines running across are parallel and equal distance, but they don't look it due to the effect of the different lines coming through it. They look like they're all twisted, different directions, but actually they're all parallel. So this is optical illusion. Our eyes are not perfect. We make mistakes. This looks like it's moving. It appears to have motion. The different circles.
In each center, you can see they appear like they're almost rotating there. Motion. It's another illusion. Our eyes have that defect that we can we don't see perfectly. Here's another one. Oh, let's go back. The man is making a mistake. He's meant to go on the plane on the wrong up the wrong stairs. So making a mistake. So four defects of conditioned souls. And because of those defects, that's why we don't get perfect knowledge from our own self, depending on our own self. We cannot, we're not the source of perfect knowledge. We need to therefore take shelter, we need to hear from the Hare Krishna Prabhus, can you hear me? Any of you, has anybody not taken the disciple course who is in Bhakti Shastri class? Maybe, must be some of you. Okay, and you, this is this is something which is often discussed in the disciple course uh, because you know we're sentimental devotees. We're often guided by our own mind and senses, and sometimes we don't think about things how they affect others. So it's an important thing, which, an, an important point which we want you to think about in the course of this evening and tomorrow before we meet again. Has to me, or uh, some big function like that, you get a lot of people. Kuala Lumpur. Everybody's a devotee. We well, have some devotion coming to attend the program. It's interesting topic. We'll come back to this question. We'll go ahead. Oh. <laughs> we're not going to be able to do this because we're, you know, we're in the virtual presentation here. We're doing it all online. We're in different places. But I would like you to think, I would like you to consider yourself, what are some examples of these four defects? Let's go back. Can we ask someone who hasn't spoken so far to give us an example of a mistake someone made? which maybe caused him a lot of trouble, got a big problem. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah, the commit mistake, one of the examples is uh, when we carry out our duty, you know, we're doing arati or anything, so we can also make some mistakes. What mistake would you make when you do arati? Tell me. Uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe you, you offer the, the conch, you offer the hanky before you offer the conch, the water in yeah. the conch. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. You get the order wrong or something when you're doing the RT, right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay, okay, that's a good, that's a nice example, yeah, you commit a mistake. Yeah, it's not a serious mistake, but, you know, it's a, a mistake, you made a mistake. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else can offer, can think of something? One lady, let's hear from the Marijis. A mistake? Marijis? You don't make mistakes? Now I'm sure you I'm sure you all cook. Do you ever make mistakes when you cook? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> Tell me what you did, what you could do. Doesn't you maybe you didn't do it, but just give an example. While cooking sometimes we want to uh, maybe want to I mean the 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 food may be something sweet, but maybe we wrongly get insult inside. Yes. Very true. That's it. You put the salt, you think it's sugar. That yes. Somebody did that with the Charanamrita one time. Srila Prabhupada was in the temple and he came to take the Charanamrita and he said, oh, this has got salt in it. Prabhupada, <laughs> Prabhupada was not pleased. He said, who's done this? And then they got some person who done it. Prabhupada told the temple manager, he said, Get someone responsible to do it in future. So, <laughs> you have to be very careful you're doing things like yeah. Charanamrita, especially when the spiritual teacher is there. You know, you don't want to put salt. Okay. All right, we'll go on to the second one, illusion. Some examples. Nobody likes to admit their illusions. Uh, we just want examples, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be real, but... Some example of illusion, he's in illusion. Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Yeah, so there is, um, I, I actually, I mean, we have the, uh, the, the real, uh, I mean, the story from the scriptures that states on the, how uh, Maharaja Yudhishthir and uh, yeah, Yamaraj had the conversation on uh, what is the biggest illusion in the material world, and, and then the answer was that, the biggest illusion is actually to think that when you see somebody die and then you think that is not going to happen to me, that is the biggest illusion that someone has in the material world. That is one story that we have. Oh. And, uh, and the other one that I can think of is right now we have all these bogus, uh, bogus uh, I mean, practicality, practical things that's happening in the material world. We have all these bogus gurus who claim themselves to be God. Like uh, it started off with Sai Baba, and then we have this now this Nityananda Swami. He put all this uh, universal uh, picture, universal planetary system at the back of his, uh, you know. And then he put all this. He wear the costumes of Lord Shiva, and he thinks that uh, he's God. He claims that, and then he gives all this. Uh, uh, he he manipulates the scriptures, and he does also nonsense. So that is one one sort of illusion that people believe that. This guy, this guy could be God. I, yeah, I, I, I think that's a good cheating one, that one, you know, the one. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. That might be cheating, okay. yeah. But your illusion one, yeah, very nice example you're giving that people don't think they're going to die, but we all have to go there. We have to go. That's one temple we all go to, right? The temple of Yamaraj at the time of death. So, cheating. Maharaji gave a very nice example there, people cheating, pretending they're God, they're incarnations of God, like that. That's common. Like the magicians, how about the magicians, is it illusion? Which one? The magicians. Magicians. 
Mm, magician say do some magic trick. Yeah. To bring some money out of your ear or something. Right? Yeah, magic by magic they can bring it out from their ear. And they can do these kind of things. So they, they have people put it they cut them up. It appears like they put saws and everything through them. But actually it, it's just an illusion. So there are a lot of illusions like that. But we were talking more about the mental, the mental illusion. That, that, that's a more visual illusion. But the illusion can be also in the mind. That we're thinking, we're thinking I'm very great, I'm very important, I'm very necessary. We think how can the world ever go on if I'm not there? <laughs> you know, we have that illusion. We're thinking we're so very important, but we're so very insignificant, actually. The illusion. Prabhupada told the story to one devotee. He was a, a big manager in the temple in Los Angeles. And Prabhupada told him how the material world is one-fourth of the spiritual world, but there are unlimited numbers of planets in the material world, unlimited numbers of universes, and in each universe is unlimited number of planets. And on this one planet, in one universe, there's one planet Earth, and on Earth there's one, sit one place called America, and in America there's one city called Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles there's so many roads, and so many streets. there's one street called Watseka Avenue, and on Watseka Avenue it's a big long road, there are many houses, many people living there, but there's this one temple at 3764 Watseka Avenue, and in this Watseka Avenue there are many devotees, but this one devotee, he's thinking he is the Supreme Controller. So like that, Prabhupada is pointing out the illusion which devotees often have. Illusion. That we're, we're, illusion, we're in illusion about our significance, our importance. And then the cheating propensity. Maharaji gave a very nice example there about in bogus incarnation. Any other cheating propensity going on? How about the businessman, Maharaj? Yes. What are they doing? They tell uh, the books are very good. <laughs> they tell it's very cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not cheap. Well, the Maharaj, that, uh, Maharaj, regarding the political leaders, they promise us a lot of things and uh, in the end they don't uh, fulfill their promises. Yes, right. Yeah, politicians, very good. They promise us cannot fulfill their promises. <laughs> Good. All right. And then finally, imperfect senses. Some example. Imperfect senses. You're parking your car, and you think you park it, and, and you, hmm? Imperfect senses. Somebody's driving the car, parking the car. You may park it and you think you can park it, but you you hit something. Yeah, if you can mute your please mute your microphone, please. Someone can give example. We want the memory of a goldfish. What? 
sometimes sometimes we have the memory of goldfish. We just read. Uh, we just read like we forgot the content about it. <laughs> you mean you read something and you forget it all? You can't remember it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're talking here now. We cannot give knowledge to anyone, nor are we ourselves perfect. Therefore, we accept the Vedas as they are. Everyone knows the meaning of the word Veda? What does Veda mean? Veda scriptures, Maharaj. Yeah, I want to know the meaning of the word Veda. Knowledge. Thank you, Prabhu. Knowledge. Right. Veda means knowledge. So, Veda is knowledge. Everything is there in the Veda. Please mute your microphone. Some of you people, you have to mute your microphone. So the Vedas, they're dealing with the fruitive activities. Vedas are mainly dealing with what we call karma, the karma kandi activities, how we can enjoy the results of the work. So fruitive activities, Vedas talk about this, what you need to do, to get a good family, what you need to do to make a lot of money, what you need to do to go to heaven, to enjoy life more. The Vedas tell us all this kind of knowledge. So the Vedas deal most, mostly with fruitive activity to gradually elevate public from the field of sense gratification, karma, to a position on the transcendental plane, right? The Vedas are working towards that, to bring us up to the transcendental plane, to bring us away from sense gratification. From the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, verse 45, Prabhupada talks about the Upanishads there. Does everyone know the meaning of Upanishad? Someone can tell me what does the word Upanishad mean? Nobody know? Yes? I can't hear I'm closer. To understanding the truth, the absolute truth, right? This is the meaning of Upanishad, that knowledge which brings. In fact, if you look at the Ishopanishad, if you have a hard copy, you'll see there's a subtitle. And just below Isho, Sri Ishopanishad on the inside cover, usually they will print the subtitle. And the subtitle of the Ishopanishad is that knowledge which brings one closer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So you, the, the chance for spiritual realization is offered in the form of the Upanishads. Upanishads mark the beginning of transcendental life, right? The beginning. Transcendental. It's not the highest knowledge, but it's the beginning of transcendental life. So, Ishopanishad. 
This Upanishad is one of the Upanishads and it, it's the most famous of the Upanishads. So Prabhupada describes here that the Upanishads mark the beginning of transcendental life. Different from karmakanda, from material activity. Page 103 in your student handbook. You will notice there are two headings. On the left side is the Shruti and on the right side we have the Smriti. Right? The Shruti is describing the original Vedas. The Vedas are there. You can see Vedas. Original ve four Vedas meaning Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atarva Veda. Four Vedas. And also you have the Upanishads. We're studying one of the Upanishads. We're studying the Ishopanishad. Ishopanishad. Isha means the Upanishad about the Supreme Lord. Isha means Ishwara, the Supreme Lord. So there, but there are many Upanishads, but we're studying the most famous of the Upanishads, the Ishopanishad. Prabhupada writes, actually there's uh, 11 Upanishads which are very popular, which are available, which are known today. But of the eleven, it's the Ishopanishad which is the most well known. So we have two columns, the, the Shruti and the Smriti. Shruti means hearing that knowledge which comes from the Supreme Lord, described there. Revealed absolute truth, every word, every word unchanged eternally, that's the Vedas. Now the, the Shruti is meant to be, well, it's the property really of the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are the one to, res, to recite the Vedas. If one is not a brahmana, then he's considered unqualified to recite the Vedas. So that's why traditionally you'd have the brahmanas who would sit and they, they could be hired to recite different Vedas for us to hear. And you can see the different divisions of the Vedas, There's the, as well as the Upanishads. You have the Vedangas, and then you have the Samitas, and the Brahmanas, which are also, but they're about the rituals and mantras. And you have the Aranyakas, and Upanishads. So many different parts of the, of the Vedas are there. Kalpa, Shiksha, Vyankarna. Nirukta, Chandas, Jyotish. Jyotish is about the astrology, astronomy rather. It's more well known. So this is all the, 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 the Shruti, which is eternal, never changes. But on the other side, we have the, the Smriti.
the Shruti is like the mother. We said, you want to know about the father? You have to ask the mother. And the Smriti is like a sister. The sister hears everything from the mother. So the Smriti is a little different from the four Vedas. The Smriti is made up of things like the uh, mentioned here, the Puranas, the Itihasas, Pancharatras, Tantras, all of these different kinds of things. You have also Mahabharata. Now Mahabharata is not really Shruti, although Mahabharata is sometimes called the fifth Veda. But it's not one of the original Vedas, because Mahabharata is written by Vyasadeva. So we want you to understand a little of the nature of the Vedic knowledge. There are two, dis two divisions, the Shruti and the Smriti. One time devotees were in Berkeley in California and the devotees wanted to have a, 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 a program in the University of California there at Berkeley and one of the professors there from the Asian studies he didn't like it. He objected to it. He said, oh, it's just sentimental, just chanting and singing. But Prabhupada explained to him, he said, well, he said, you may be following Shruti, but we accept Smriti. And you see, there are certain, there are certain people who only accept the Shruti. They won't accept the Smriti. So if they don't accept the Smriti, means they don't accept the Puranas. That means they don't accept Bhagavad Gita even. They will accept only the four Vedas and the Upanishads. They will accept only these things because these books, this knowledge, those scriptures are eternal. But the Smriti is written, is compiled by great sages in the course of time. Just like Mahabharata, Srimad Bhagavatam was compiled 5,000 years ago. Srila Vyasadeva wrote the Puranas and he wrote Mahabharata, these things. But the Vedas are much older than that. So, some scholars, they will only accept Shruti, they will not accept Smriti. Therefore, sometimes when Prabhupada is writing a purport, he will say, there's a, he will give a verse from the Vedas, Vedic evidence to support his point. If Prabhupada wants to make a point, he will sometimes say, in the Vedas it is said, and then he will quote some Upanishad. This is very important. Those of you who are preaching, you have to understand that some people will not accept Bhagavad Gita. They will not accept Puranas. They want to hear Vedic knowledge. And for them, Vedic knowledge means only the Shruti, only the Vedas, only the Upanishads. You have to be able to quote from them. One of our devotees in America, Ridainanda Maharaj, he was preaching and he had to go and preach at one program where there was a, there was a smarter Brahmin.